All right, great. Well, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Charles Delfs. I'm, I'm from Toronto, Canada. And uh, my company is uh, Delfs Engineering. I'm uh, originally um, from an engineering technical background. And uh, tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about sort of the state of, uh, of modern web publishing and kind of where, where uh, internet publishing and database publishing came from. And uh, I want to introduce you, introduce you to a new product uh, called FM Better Forms as well. So I'm just going to go through some, uh, some slides. There's not really too many slides. This actual slideshow is actually built out of the uh, uh, is a FileMaker database that's uh, dynamically published. So, so if you see me, it's, it's, a little bit, uh, it's a little bit rudimentary. I kind of whipped it up as, at, the, uh, at the airport when I was speaking at .fmp in Berlin. So I'm an electrical engineer by, uh, by trade. I come from a hardware background originally. Um, my, uh, I really, really love, love the concept of problems. That's kind of something that I'm fascinated with. More so much even sometimes than getting things done, it's more just solving the problem. Um, I originally started coding on a ZX81. Anybody uh, had one of those? No. No? no. no? <laughs> you guys even know what that is? <laughs> so that's a, uh, that was an 8-bit yeah, eight, eight computer uh, in the early 80s. And that was the only thing that I could afford all the rich kids at Apple's. And uh, I had that one that had to solder it together myself. Um, I started coding uh, at, at FileMaker in, uh, from since version version two, and and I write that's that is not necessarily a good thing, because what it does is it gives us a lot of opinionation or a, a, a real kind of mindset. And somebody had mentioned there that they just started coding at version sixteen, was it? Yeah. Right, and that's actually don't ever think that that's a bad thing. It's actually a really, really good thing because what it does is it means you don't have a mindset that's tied to the old way FileMaker used to do things, and you certainly don't make ugly layouts. I've seen, I find <laughs> older ask developers are we, we less we care about UI and the more we just care about functionality, and but uh, in today's day and age, uh, UI is, is really it's part of that. Uh, my uh, just a bit of personal stuff. I'm a martial artist as well. I have a martial arts school. I've been teaching martial arts for about 35 years or so, and uh, I'm a musician as well. Yes, I'm Canadian. I do sometimes say a. I will try my best to not say too many. Uh, I say about. I don't know what the difference between about and about and about is. Everybody corrects me, but I, I honestly don't hear the difference. Uh, as far as a friendly, I'm not sure. You gotta. You know, you can judge for yourself on that one. All right. So what I want to do is I want to talk, I want to start talking with uh, talking about some of the older technologies that we used to use for publishing FileMaker. Uh, IWP uh, was probably I guess our original. Even before that, I think there was a CDML um, that's around version three to five or something like that, and then that got dropped later on for instant web publishing. Um, does anybody still have any instant web publishing databases that are running right now? No. no. Uh, no? I was at uh, speaking. I was speaking at I think it was uh, New Orleans, the um, <clears throat> pause on air, and somebody in the crowd, a guy who's about 35 years old, he says, "What's IWP?" I was like, "Like crazy kids, right?" They don't. He didn't. He didn't actually he didn't actually know that that old technology, which is totally good. It's actually a really good thing. Custom web publishing, which is uh, the really, it's really the interface that FileMaker provided for allowing uh, data to be surfaced through uh, external applications. Um, primarily, there's an XML gateway and a PHP gateway, which is really just a, a layer on top of the XML gateway. And then there's other, there were some other platforms and languages. Uh, PHP was probably the most dominant one that people coded in, and is still an excellent, uh, very, very mature um, uh, language to uh, to develop in as well. Right. In terms of newer technologies, where things are moving, uh, in from the FileMaker side, of course, we have WebDirect. And WebDirect takes advantage of, of some newer newer types of uh, frameworks, Vaadin being the underlying technology. And Vaadin is a, um, a real-time technology, and there's other ones as well. Better Forms is actually on a, a real-time technology as well. We'll talk about that a little bit. PHP with frameworks. Traditional PHP coding, if you're still doing stuff like that where you're doing true, everything gets rendered on the server, and then it gets dumped out, and then you're refreshing pages, just you need to stop doing that and start kind of catching up in terms of technology. Um, the frameworks with PHP are excellent, Laravel being the dominant one, and it's a really, really incredible, powerful uh, uh, suite of uh, support and uh, community knowledge and things like that, uh, modules and so on. So it's quite, quite powerful. 
Um, there's a few other ones. The JavaScript frameworks are super, super powerful as well. I'm not sure if anybody's done anything with uh, things like Angular or React or Vue.js. Has anybody used any of those? Yes. If you're putting your hand up, I can't see, I'm going to be honest with you. So, <laughs> Canadians, we have good eyesight, but not that good. I was actually going to thinking about uh, coming down. I was going to drive down, but uh, I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't. I had to finish up. We're just wrapping up a couple projects, so I couldn't pull the time, unfortunately. Maybe next time I'm going to invite it back. Um, JavaScript frameworks are really, really powerful. Uh, one of the things that with the JavaScript community is major the majority of the lower level code is open source, and what that means is people uh, contribute from a community aspect. Uh, code gets reviewed by other people. Code gets constantly modified. It changes exceptionally fast. That means the JavaScript frameworks that I started building better forms with a year ago have changed significantly. That if I had to start all over again, I might change some of the some of the core things. Uh, it changes literally that fast. Um, PHP, we've you know for the prior 10 years, 15 years, I've been coding in PHP or whatever it's been. Um, that hasn't changed nearly as nearly as quick. Um, SPAs and PWAs. SPA is a single page web application, just to kind of bring you up on the nomenclature. So a single page web application is basically something like WebDirect, Facebook, any, any of the modern apps where you're not actually refreshing the entire DOM, the entire, uh, the entire uh, browser uh, code. You're instead just loading in dynamically through Ajax typically, uh, loading in a chunk of code in there. A PWA is called a, is a, an acronym for Progressive Web App. And basically what makes a progressive web app is that the app, there's a few, there's a few um, standards for it. One of the things is the app can sometimes work offline. Uh, the app can load relatively quickly. It is a single page web app usually. It can be saved to the desktop of your, or the, uh, the home screen of your iPhone or your Android phone, if you're one of those people, um, as well. So PWAs would be something like Twitter Mobile is a, is a PWA. And uh, I'm going to demonstrate a PWA that I uh, that just went live yesterday as well. So if you guys have any questions, by all means, please just jump in. I'll hear you, and then I can I can stop. But I'm going to move along. I'm going to move along pretty quick in this uh, this background stuff here. In terms of tools, I'm not sure if uh, if you're if you're using many tools outside of FileMaker. I use uh, a number of them because I, I cross-platform develop. Although I'm, I'm fundamentally a FileMaker guy, I, I uh, I've done lots of uh, lots of work for all of the big dev houses and uh, my own clients over the years. But um, there's a lot of a lot of really really excellent tools that are available now. And uh, if you to use start using some of these tools for some of the work you're doing, for example, editors. Um, there's excellent code editors. VS Code is probably the most dominant code uh, one that's emerging. It's super super flexible, open source, made by Microsoft. Um, IDEs are embedded uh, or integrated developer environments. Those are entire environments that, like FileMaker is an IDE where it allows you to develop everything from end to end more or less in one application. Um, there's a number of uh, companies that produce IDEs. VS Code is kind of moving to an IDE type environment where it can control more things. Uh, I personally use uh, Cloud9 uh, IDE, which was purchased by um, Amazon just recently. And I find that to be quite good. Why you'd want to use that is if you're doing something where you're maybe you've got some clients and those clients have a couple web pages and the other time you maybe make a couple edits to those pages and want to push those things out. Um, the IDEs are, are with a, a build chain, a build environment. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Is really really the way to go. How many people still uh, still transfer files with FTP? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm going to be honest with you, I, I work in the web stuff 90% of the time, and I haven't used FTP in a year and a half, um, just because I have a, a different um, environment that when, we, when I do development, we're not actually sending files up to a server anymore. I'm actually working on the server or working on a server-like environment, and then when I deploy it, it just spins up another server automatically, like a serverless type, type scenario. So it makes it, once you start taking advantage of some of these new, newer tools that are out there and, and becoming really aware of them, it's amazing how much more productive you can be. Things are really, really have changed. Uh, to, to, to jump up to the next one here. I mentioned a little bit about open source software, and, and this is really great because we can, we're just on the, on, the, on the verge now 
where we're starting to see a lot of developers contributing to, first of all, they're using GitHub. Um, if you haven't used GitHub already, GitHub is a giant code repository. It's open, uh, sorry, it's uh, free for open source projects. And it allows people to commit uh, changes to your code. FileMaker is a little bit more challenging to commit a change to the code, but every, most other uh, platforms are quite easy. And the biggest thing uh, with GitHub is that um, you have this huge community of, of code that you can you can pick things out of. Right? Since now we can finally use, or since the last few versions of FileMaker, we can really, really uh, take advantage of JavaScript inside a web viewer and, and have a lot of powerful plugins and things like that. Um, GitHub is going to become more and more um, relevant to our community. Node Package Manager is a uh, another website. It's a site of open source code. There's also you can also um, have uh, enterprise deployments there as well for bigger companies. And basically, what they do is they take the code that's in GitHub and it wraps it all up nice so that you can easily integrate it into another application and you can download it and you can manage manage versions. And that's incredibly powerful as well. Just to put this stuff into perspective, when we use um, uh, some popular, say, FileMaker, I'll call it open source code. Let's, uh, Richard Carlton's uh, FM starting point, if you guys have used that before. Um, that's, a, that's an example of some code that's kind of open source, but we can't really contribute to it. So it probably has maybe five or 10 con contributors over the years. Whereas if that was managed like open source uh, code, in JavaScript and on GitHub and NPM, that would literally have maybe a thousand to say five thousand for something like that contribute contributors over the years. So you can imagine how much knowledge uh, um, and and things like that can go into stuff. A um, couple of things here: the development life cycle. Uh, FileMaker is pretty unique in terms of how we develop. Right? We basically log into the machine, develop, and then we walk away from it, and hopefully everything's good. Uh, if you're really, really meticulous, you probably have maybe a dev environment and you deploy it and you might have some kind of uh, deployment uh, deployment cycle. Some of the uh, more modern architectures that uh, you can start to think about, uh, one of them is a big one that's, that's uh, really, really emerging. It's called continuous integration. We kind of do continuous integration with FileMaker because we make a change and it's live right away, which is... That's one of the great things about FileMaker, what's a, what's makes it, what makes it so unique. Um, just referring back to when we were talking about uploading files and things like that through FTP, that was kind of like a slow integration system. So now we have uh, build chains which allow us to basically type a few lines of code and then, and then the um, file tests itself. And then if it passes the test, it autom automatically gets moved to maybe a staging server and then the staging QR, Q, uh, quality control people or quality assurance people will check it out over the next day. And if they pass it off, then it goes into production automatically. We're just starting to be able to do this with uh, a few migration tools, the data migration tool and, a, and a, the uh, couple commercial wrappers. And I'm sure you're going to see some open source wrappers that'll, that'll just uh, uh, be amazing over the next, next few years. But right now, we do have a couple commercial products to help automate those processes. So this is something you can start sort of thinking about to build really, really solid FileMaker code. Um, one of the things, uh, we'll be sort of producing some more articles on this, and we can talk more about that later on. This is some of the, um, some of the structure that we're trying to bring into the FileMaker side of better forms as well, and that's why I'm mentioning, it, mentioning this. All right. So I just want to talk about better forms itself. Better forms is a framework and it started off as, as, as a framework to allow uh, myself to build projects easier. But at the same time, I was working with a number of other developers, so I had to not have too much opinion in the code and keep it really, really flexible for the other developers. So this is just, uh, if you're looking for a little bit more background knowledge, um, you, can, you can visit it at fmbetterforms.com. But basically what it is, it's an interface and it's a platform as a service that allows developers like ourselves to keep our FileMaker chops and maybe learn a little bit of outside the box, not a lot, you don't have to learn a lot, but learn a little bit and give us that ability to, to do some web publishing. Uh, we don't really have to know CSS, you don't have to know uh, JavaScript, 
helps if you just understand JavaScript a tiny, tiny bit, which I think everybody does just intuitively by looking at it as well. So I want to show you. Uh, I want to show you some of the things that it's that's built on, um, and underneath the hood, we take I take advantage of all of these technologies that we we've talked about as well. So <clears throat> jump back here for just a second. So I want to jump right in, right into things, and I'm going to show you some of the. Uh, I'm going to show you two or three uh, applications that were built in better in better forms. This is one that I'm currently working on not, not now. Actually, it's not Portal Master. I think I got the wrong wrong ID or IP. There we go. All right, let's log in here. All right, this is something that I'm building for. Um, this was in production, and this is a new version of this. That's uh, a little bit more as a portal. It's a business portal for Charles Abbott Associates in California, and there you have a company called E4 Works, which uh, does building inspections. And from here, a local builder can log in and they can go through. This isn't totally built out yet. This is just in the works. And they they can see their existing building permits. They can load load up a given permit. I'm just going to shrink this down a little bit. Is the resolution okay on that? Is it? I, I dropped the resolution on my monitor just because I know it's being projected. Is that right? Yeah, we can see this. Yeah, that's fine. Great. So in this particular case, uh, you can see that there's all customized theme. There's a little bit of a uh, image in the sidebar here, some logo stuff. There's some data tables that are happening here. The um, the user can go and request a building permit. And in this case, all of these values that are inside this list. This is a uh, this company sells sells their permit software to various uh, counties, and so they're really a software as a service. And as such, doing building a SaaS out of FileMakers is is kind of tricky. You generally have to take one of three approaches, and usually it's only two one of two approaches. Um, usually, you spin up an entire instance of the da the database, so you clone your whole database and you white label it somehow, and uh, you host it for them on one of you know one of one of your servers. Um, that's the most common way we we. Um, deal with FileMaker, but then you start to run into the deployment issues where you're having to deal with things like versioning and whatnot. So then the second way is you have uh, you have a single front end, which is where better forms can kind of start to come in. Uh, you have a single front end and you dynamically connect up to different databases in the back end. And that's what's happening here. This same application front end, just through the, the, the subdomain, connects up to one of um, one of about 30 or 40 or so of their backend databases. So this way they keep their existing deployment strategy, everything stays intact, but any new code that they develop, they can uh, they can continue to take advantage of some, some newer technology and, and still have lots of security, lots of data isolation um, and uh, client sovereignty, I guess you would call it, um, between, between accounts and things. So these value lists here are dynamically generated and they come from the specific database that this is connected to. There's also some other customization in here. You can see that, for example, um, these, this particular set of business rules for this file, or sorry, this uh, county, yeah, this is actually their, their development, development machine I'm connected to, but it only supports, they, only, they don't allow building inspections or somebody to book an inspection on the weekends, but, and only, it looks like I think four weeks or so out, because once they get past, yeah, once they get past four weeks, one, two, three, four, then they can't, they can't book. Those, that logic, actually comes from FileMaker based on each individual in, individual city. So that's kind of, uh, uh, that's kind of how, how that particular app works. I'm just gonna go jump back here and I'm gonna jump to another one. This is one that is going live tomorrow. And what this is, they, I'm still, we're still, still waiting. We're still waiting for the client to give us some actual, uh, actual non-placeholder text. But this is an application for a university and, and I'm just gonna kind of Go through it. Go through it quick. It has. It's a multi-step, uh, multi-step wizard. And then, as the user goes through, you can see they have a whole bunch of fields and there's various types of validations. Better Forms allows you, <laughs> like, like conditional, conditional fields. If you're not a Canadian citizen, this field disappears. If you are, there's a little animation that shows up. Things like that here, just like that. So these, a lot of these fields have various bits of animation and so on um, connected to them. There's also in this case they have an accordion with uh, the students can make a maximum of three choices so they can sorry my meeting my meeting 
uh, icons are sitting right over my stuff here, so I'm gonna, that's okay. So inside this accordion, they have, you know, various choices. A lot of these are all dynamic. All of this, all of these fields change based on the choice because it's a really convoluted, uh, um, convoluted method. Here we have accordions within accordions. So you can imagine the data structure here. This would be the FileMaker equivalent of a record with a child record with another child record inside that record. And the data comes back from be from better forms. So we return the data in JSON. So this is not live connected to a FileMaker field as such. It's not hard coded to that. We receive a JSON object, and it's up to you as a developer to do whatever you want with that object. The advantage of doing that is it gives you excellent security. Now you can authenticate the user, and then you can uh, authorize the user and say, yes, this user is allowed to maybe update this file or see that file. Whereas in FileMaker, as soon as I go into here, I start ty typing something, I basically have edited. <clears throat> so, so we can have a lot more um, isolation by separating the, the front end from the back end of FileMaker. All right, I'm just gonna jump back. I'm gonna show you one more application. I'll show you how, how, how things kind of work under the hood to give you a little bit better idea. Oh, we're not gonna go to that one just yet. Let's go to here. I, I mentioned about, uh, and you can do this, you can hit this one on your phone. This one just went live yesterday. It is a web app that is designed for oops, that is designed for the, uh, the basketball league and this basketball. So it's meant to actually look kind of small on the screen, but it's it's responsive, so it doesn't really matter. Um, this designer that I was working with, he's actually a user experience designer, but he doesn't do so much coding, but he does a lot of uh, UI stuff. So he's exceptionally fussy. If you've ever worked with a client that's like that, I'll just give you just a just to put it in perspective here, this is an example here of one of the one of the layouts how he how he how he spec'd out the layout. So you can imagine that he he's extremely particular, right down to the you know pixel 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 per pixel. It has to represent exactly what he wants. So we pretty much hit it about 99%. I think it's uh, it's we work quite a bit quite a bit one on one with him, and we ended up getting this this web app and basically I'm just gonna oops I'm gonna close this here. So I'm in some kind of weird responsive mode here. So let me just do this because I'm not sure what's going on there with my browser. Run. And you can hit this on your if you want to hit it from your phone right now. It's mmbl.run. And you can actually play around with it. What makes this this application so special is he had he had a, a couple really really uh, tight requirements. He said I don't want to see spinners. I don't want this app to. I want it to feel like a web app. And so if you save this app to your desktop, it'll launch full screen automatically, and it feels really really uh, native to the phone. Even even custom placeholders. So in this case, there's a whole bunch of games you can scroll. There's like inertial scrolling on here. All of these things are strictly defined through JSON. I have very, very little code that, that went in here. If we dig in, we can see user images. These come from FileMaker and right down to the, uh, to the layout. There is personal information that I did uh, waiver myself that uh, he said they all signed waivers that it's okay to have it publicly on their app. So if you want to crank call them, it's okay. Just don't say about this. Uh, no, give, give yourselves away. All right, so that's, uh, that's kind of how a web app works. Does that work okay on your phone? Did anybody try it? Yeah. One of the things you'll notice is as you're navigating through, once you go through one of these main divisions, the division loads, that loads about 200K of data, and it loads it as a giant JSON object based on the relationship in FileMaker. And it takes that giant JSON object, and it just navigates around throughout that. So. All of the data now sits in my client here, my browser. And when I move around, when I navigate around, there's not a lot of information because the leak just went, um, we took out all the fake data and it just went live. But as I navigate around, all of this, all of these dynamic sorts, they all happen on the client side. So everything is virtually instantaneous as I, as I move, move around. And I can dig in, dig in there. Once I hit those pictures, once I go there, the browser's loaded and they're cached. So, so it's pretty, Pretty, pretty quick, pretty snappy. So that was uh, that was something that we built. Now this is uh, a fairly complex app in the sense of 
in the sense of the data that it has to uh, manipulate and surf around. But it gives you an idea of some of the things that you can build relatively easily and with almost no knowledge of, of any technologies outside of FileMaker. Right, this one does, you do need a little, there's a little bit of HTML and a little bit of uh, uh, JavaScript in here as well. Okay, so I'll show you how, uh, does anybody have any questions so far? No? No? Okay, good. Well, not good, but bad. All right, so here's an example, and what we'll do is we'll build this out a little bit so that we can, uh, we can, we can see kind of things, how things work uh, uh, if you as a developer. So I have a database in the background right here it's a pretty fancy one and if we look at the uh if we look inside the database i have id i have name first name last email maybe a signature i have another field i did call the application json but that's, that's just that was just for demonstration it's not uh not used here so i basically have some simple fields first name last name email and so on and what i want to do is i want to build an application that says uh something along along the lines of we're going to have our, actually maybe like a survey, um, survey gather, to gather comments on, to see how well the Canadian guy spoke at the, uh, at our last meetup. So, and then we want them to sign it too, in case there's some, uh, some, some crank, crank, uh, crank applications in there. So we have a pretty simple form here, first name, last name, and email, like so. But we, have, we don't have any way of submitting it. So it's a really, really simple, uh, simple form right now. So what I want to do is I want to go over to the Better Forms editor. And this is kind of what uh, Better Forms as an application looks like. It, um, we're currently in VIP preview, which is uh, a limited a limited access uh, preview version um, until we build out some more uh, documentation as the main thing. It's not so much in terms of features, but mostly in terms of documentation right now. So I'm going to edit this particular form, which is called job application. And it's called demo job application. Forms are edited in better forms with uh, JSON schema. So you do need to know a little bit, bit of, little bit of JSON. And if you haven't learned some of that right now, you, you should start, to be honest with you. So you can see here, this is pretty straightforward. There's like three, one, two, three uh, objects here. And within the objects, we have some definitions, which happens, happen to define these, these fields, first name, last name, and email. And there's various things, the type of input that it is, the, um, the label, if there's a placeholder, we want it, we can add a placeholder, whether it's some validation, whether it's required, we can do take, can take advantage of some styling. If I want to make this column, uh, better forms uses bootstrap under the hood in terms of a, a CSS uh, structure or framework. So if you imagine this screen built into 12 columns, this is going this right now is three columns, three columns, or sorry, <laughs> good math. You know, an engineer. Uh, four columns, four columns, four columns, all the way across here. So I can make one of those columns a little smaller. We'll, we'll do that actually just later on there. If we want, we can make it change it pretty easily. But I want to add a little bit more. So maybe we want to add an area for the uh, people to to type a, some type of comments or something like that. So I'm going to add a text area text area right in here. We have a little quick snippet code reference. Better Forms has access to the clipboard, so we can grab that item off the clipboard. I'm just going to stick it right in here, right there. And um, please be nice, Charles. OK, we'll just write that. That's going to be a hint. That's going to show up underneath. We're going to land the uh, thoughts. Thoughts, there we go. And we're going to stick this in a field called um, comments, right? This better forms sticks all of the data into a JSON object. And this is what the name of the key within that object will be. So I'm going to call it comments. This is a text area object that I'm adding in. And I'm going to make this about six rows. So I'm just going to save that. If you want to, if you want to play the home game, you can uh, go to demo.fmbetterforms.com. Um, slash hashtag slash application there we go and you can you can follow along all right so you see there's my there's my my field that's great there's our comment box i only made it six columns out of 12 maybe we'll make it a little just for visual we'll increase that to, to, to eight and we need a couple other things let's add a button on the end i'm actually going to add just a horizontal actually we'll just go eight here let me just make that bigger 
I'm going to add a horizontal divider just to space these out a little bit visually. Okay, and we want to add a button. So we search for button. So you can see it's pretty easy, right? Pretty, pretty simple for simple things. So here's a button object right here. It says push me. I'm going to change it to um, submit. Submit. And we can define what the button looks like through um, various CSS classes and things like that. Um, but I think that's it. The button has one other real key thing here. It has a, a the square back brackets denote an array, so it takes actions. It can accept actions. So right now, if I have this button on here and I and I refresh my page, you'll see that my button doesn't actually do anything. All right? I click on my button, nothing's going on. So it would be nice to actually submit it to FileMaker. So let's build that out a little bit. What we want to do is we want to run a, a script, and it's called Utility. We'll run a Utility call script. So that script is going to call a script in FileMaker. And this is just an arbitrary parameter that's stuck in here. But it's basically going to call FileMaker and say, hey, here's the whole form. Here's the user. Uh, I don't have any authentication on that particular page. But if I did, here would be the user. No, that's off. Um, and here's all the data that they submitted. So now we, we're going to call this form. I'm going to go over to FileMaker here. Oops. All right. And we're going to look in the script area. And we have a whole bunch of scripts here. And these scripts are automatically generated with, with better forms. And they're provisioned automatically and they're connected up, uh, they're connected up through um, some wizards that you can you walk through. So it's pretty easy to install these. Uh, we have a job application, which is the one, and we're going to run this script right here. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to interact with the front end. So now this script right here, there's nothing in it right now, a little bit of logging at the top and it just exits at the bottom. But we're going to interact with our front end from the back end now. So I want to say show a, a, a modal type dialog that says, hey, I've submitted this application, thank you very much. So that's pretty easy. We are basically going to add something called an action. And the actions are going to go into an, a global variable called BF actions, actions. There we go. All right. And we want to do a modal. So I got one right here. And I'm not going to put any title type. I'm going to call it success. There's uh, some documentation that explains what these different types are. This one's going to throw a little icon, or sorry, an animated uh, checkbox mm -hmm. icon. And that'll kind of give the user some uh, happy feeling. Great. Thanks for your comments. We won't tell Carl, right? Even though he's he, he's a basic man. All right. And theme, we have a couple options here. We have a light and a dark, and we can add a whole bunch of other options, extra buttons and things like that into the uh, into this modal as well, but I'm not going to. So that's it. I think that's good. So we run that, and that is it. That's all we need to do to interact with the front end. So let's go over to our website here. And, <coughs> here, and I'm just going to refresh this just in case we make some changes. Read that box a little. There we go. Hit submit. And it says, great. Thanks for your comment. We won't. Tell Charles, right? So that's it. That's pretty easy. You think you can do that so far? I think so, right? So let's build it out a little bit more. And actually, we want to do a few things because I just submitted this and made the script run, but there's empty fields in here. So I need to validate this form. I see I got these some of the settings for validating on here, but I'm not actually validating the form. So what I want to do is add some validation on here. So validation is an action as well. Think of actions like script steps in FileMaker, very, very similar. So I just stick this validate action right in here into the actions array. So it's going to validate. If everything is good, it'll carry on and it'll run this utility hook. So let me save that. Let's give that a try. All right, I hit submit and it says, ah, oh, this field is required. Great. So now I can put some stuff in here. Uh, invalid email address. That one's actually checking. Right. You can do a different, a lot of different types of validation in better forms. You can do things like ranges of numbers, types of numbers, alpha, numeric. You can do regex for the regex fanboys if, you're, uh, if, you, if you use that. Um, you can even validate data based in FileMaker. So that means you could call a script in FileMaker, and that script will return some type of truthiness. Yes, 
whether you the user should be allowed to continue. And if they do, if they are, then they can continue. So in other words, if I'm doing some kind of uh, um, um, item requ requisition type form, I'm. Oh, uh, oh, sorry, my dog. Here. Hi. There's nothing like a meeting where there's a dog bark. It's not a, it's not a real meeting unless a dog barks anyway, right? So <laughs> I don't know if you ever seen, there's a um, there's a, a meeting bingo meeting bingo card I think it's something like that. And <laughs> can you hear me? You check it off. Uh, dog barks. I can't get in. Uh, you know I got to bail early. Oh, you're cutting out. Like and you just check them all off as as you go along. So I think I've hit a, I think I've hit a few so far. Okay, so let's go just jump, jumping back. So we got we have these things so far. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, let's see what else do we need to do. We need to actually sub, we're submitting this to FileMaker, but we're not creating any records. So let's just do that part here. I'm just going to create a comments field comments because I don't have one. There we go. That's done. And oops, it'd be nice if FileMaker didn't do that, right? If I could click on here, and and it didn't have that. That thing. Anyhow, okay. One day. So pretty straightforward. Exactly how you, you do things. You do things here exactly like you would in FileMaker because this is FileMaker. So you would go to layout because we're calling this from the web. So we don't really know our contacts and it's called applications. I would say new record. And I would set fields, right? Set set fields, set fields. Set field, the first field I want to set is going to be name first. I like to stick with naming conventions, and I think you should too. And we are going to, I, I like to use lower camel case. And the reason for that, um, everybody has their own famous uh, famous uh, um, naming conventions, especially if you do, if you're one of those guys, I'm going to be honest with you, because I have a lot of opinions. If you're one of these people who puts all these X's or what is it, no Z's, Zs, Z, sorry, saying okay, Z, and then some field so that it floats to the end. That just means that you don't know the name of that field and you need to find it. If you name it intelligently, you don't have to remember the names. Like, what's the most intelligent name for an ID? ID. Oops, ID. In my opinion, right? And that's something I really, really learned from other outside of the FileMaker community because we love we love title case. Everything is title case in FileMaker. Everybody agrees on that one. But the rest of the world doesn't use title case because it's not predictable. Right? If you're pure title case, it is. But if you're not sure, it's not, not totally predictable. So for the most part, most of the better form stuff is, is uh, it's, it's up to you still. You have a lot of flexibility. Data comes in to this script in a global variable. So I'm just going to pick it out. So I'm going to do a JSON get, JSON get, and I'm going to get it out of a global. Yeah, underscore model. Model is just the name of the name of the uh, the record, or the name of the data, the global, and it's name first. Name first. There we go. Done. All right. I need to do, do that for the other fields. Boom, 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 boom. Name last. I uh, I had a great opportunity to literally sit over 30 or 40 developers' shoulders for hours and hours at a time. Over the past, I don't know if it's great. Over the past uh, past few months, as we onboard people for, we do a lot of uh, a lot of one-on-one -on -one training, and as we onboard people, it's really fascinating to watch how people work. Everybody works different, and they all work totally different, but every one of them makes sense. Like I just went down here. Some people go down and across as his name last, and uh, other people will 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 fill things out, and it's it's uh, you know, do you highlight something and then replace it, or do you highlight it, delete it, and replace it? What was this one? Uh, email, email, and so on. So I, I can't, I can't knock them for that. Naming conventions, yeah, I can, I can preach a lot. There we go. Signature. Uh, I don't think I kept. I don't have. I didn't have a signature on here, did I? Oh well, we're, we'll add a signature. We're going to add one in there. We don't have one there. And comments. All right. Cool. So we're good so far. So we see, we've done that. We need to do one other thing too. We need to commit the record because we don't always do this, but it's good. It's good, really good practice, especially when you're running this because this is running on the server um, and that record may, may, may not necessarily commit. So we go to layout, new records, 
set all the fields, commit stuff, tell them it's done, and that's it. Okay, cool. Let's go back. And we can't submit, so we put first name, um, John. We have a, is there a John in the audience? No? No Johns? Okay. You guys all went home. There we go. And... All right, oops, and can't spell with BNC there. Ugh. There we go. All right, so with me so far? So what should happen here is I hit submit. We should create a record if I haven't done anything wrong. Go to layout, we create a new record, and we come back. So I hit submit, and it says, great, thank you very much, and there it is. Uh, we didn't add a comment field. We didn't set our comment field by the looks of it, but we set these ones anyway, so we're missing something. Oh, we just don't have a comment field on here. Let's change this here. There we go. So that is how you interact with with the uh, back end to the front end. I think it's I think it's pretty easy. Does anybody have any questions so far? I have a question on the so when you're adding the JSON on the in the editor, you're pulling from pre pre-made snippets that you're putting in? Yes. There are quite a, there are quite a few. There's about 30 or 40 in here. And then we also have a lot of um, example files. And that's, uh, I think, more, more so much where you, you, you might want to find some examples of how things are done. For example, uh, where's the one? I think there's one on buttons. Uh, buttons. So you can always use those for code reference and documentation as well. So here is an example of various types of buttons, right? This one here does this, and you know here's this one's a, 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 how to how to build a drop down button. Here's how to group the buttons together. Here's how how to have groups mixed with drop downs. Um, this one this button has an action behind it. These are kind of neat. This button has an automatically dismissible alert, right? There's some examples on how to do things like that with cookies, so you can leave a cookie in the, in the excuse me in the uh, client's browser as well. All of that stuff is all programmatic as well. So that's that means if you want to change something, you can actually change it in FileMaker as the data comes in and comes out. We're not BetterForms doesn't hit your layouts like traditional web publishing does. Right? Um, one of the one of the um, I, I guess you could say it's a drawback really of traditional web publishing is you you expose all of the layouts and if you've anybody's ever done this before, you expose the layouts that you want the website to hit, and you, you put the minimal number of fields on them, you don't put too much, and then FileMaker grabs that. But that means all the business logic is sitting inside your PHP code or whatever your back end is, or whatever your front end, sorry, is. Where with BetterForms, BetterForms is strictly a view layer. That means its only job is to render the interface and stuff that ha happens to do in the interface. There sometimes is business logic, oops, Sometimes there is business logic in the interface, like for example, don't don't validate, don't allow them to submit, to, uh, there you go. don't allow them to submit this record until it's valid. That's a that's a business logic thing that does sit on the interface because that's where it has to sit. But things like creating the records that shouldn't be outside of FileMaker because now you're maintaining two code bases, right? And if you're ever trying to keep something you know, progress, progressing and testable and so on, you can't do that by having multiple code bases. So we have one single code base. You, you write your own API that says, create the record and validate it and do whatever. So, so that's the code snippet. So if I go back here, do you do, do, do which one, one more? There it is there. I'm just gonna add a signature capture too, because I think that's kind of cool. Just in case somebody wants to impersonate John, do, 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 do. We're going to stick the signature capture right towards the end. And I'm just going to copy one of these and put it right in here. There we go. There. All right. So I'm just going to add a signature capture widget. There's various widgets for PayPal. Maybe we should make them pay for a com comment. We can do that too by adding a, uh, a Stripe or a PayPal gateway. Super, super easy. Um, actually, uh, we, we just added a Stripe. We just added the Stripe um, 
we did just literally about three weeks ago. And we did that for a specific use case, but we're pretty flexible like that, pretty easy. All right, so here's my signature pad, and there's my signature, first name, last name, email, make it a valid one, thoughts, yeah, 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 submit. And the cool thing is the signature comes in as base 64, so now you can dump that into a container if you want as well. So pretty flexible. <clears throat> that's, uh, that's, in a nutshell, how better forms works. I'm not sure how we're doing for time. Yeah, how are we doing for time? Yeah, we're doing good. I mean, we usually go until 8, sometimes 8.15. So. Okay, great. So, depending on what your use cases are, um, Better Forms is really, really good for certain things. Um, it's good for when you, have, when you have a use case where you have no idea how many people are going to, to jump on board. For example, I felt confident by saying, hey, go ahead, jump on an MMBL site because I know it can scale fine. Um, and then not, in that particular case, it's not even optimized um, for, for scaling, but it can t totally scale fine. Uh, it just went live and they released it to 250 players at their banquet. They all whipped out their phones and they all pulled it up, up at the same time. So you see the hit count go up, but, but it's fine. Um, so Better Forms is really, really good for that because you're not, if that was a web direct app, you would be basically tapped out with your licensing almost instantly. And the minute you tap out, it says some, suddenly there's an error, the person can't connect, which is kind of a crummy experience. Um, another thing is, it's, uh, it's of course, it's cross-platform. It's responsive. So that means these fields here, if I drop the screen down, they automatically flow over. And you can set the breakpoints and all those, those, that kind of stuff in here. You can totally customize the theme if you want to. We uh, have an initial theme that we and a theme template that you can use for reference. We're going to be eventually coming up with the ability to um, just plug in themes, and then you can customize them from there. But right now, you can have full CSS into the site. If you wanted to make this field blue or something like that, you could do that. Um, you do need to know a little bit of CSS, not very much, um, because those gurus are like a whole different breed anyway. Um, but you can do that. You can do that uh, in there as well. You can connect up to multiple databases. So it's very, very easy. If I want to make this, if I want to take this page and I want to maybe experiment with it, I can just clone this page and give it a slightly different, different slug over here. And now I can run that through testing. It can still test my same back end if I want. Maybe I wanted to test a different back end or even a different database. We can have it dynamically connect, connect up to different ones as well. I'm going to jump back over just to a couple of things. I'll explain a little bit more about some of the uh, da, 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 marketing links. <clears throat> just want to quickly mention, and this is kind of a bit of a shameless plug, but I do eat. Um, we uh, we have a we have a uh, VIP right now. Better Forms is in its uh, VIP developer preview. Basically, it's like a beta. Uh, slightly different from a beta in the sense of it's limited. We're limiting the number of people. Um, we limited them in lots of 10, and we're on our third group now. Um, it's for $4.99. You basically get unlimited uh, applications. You can build unlimited sites, unlimited users, and limited layouts. So you're not limited by anything, by limits. And uh, the only exception is if you have a vertical application that you've monetized, then it's one license per 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 those. Um, Better Forms is really, really good if you do have any ideas for verticals uh, that are good for like a software as a service and then you want to change, but it's just too hard to turn a FileMaker database into a multi-tenant application. But having separating the front end like Better Forms does makes it really, really easy. In fact, we took the back end that runs this website here. And incidentally, I don't think I mentioned that. This entire editor that we're using here that I'm moving back and forth, this is all built out of Better Forms as well. It's just another application that's sitting on top of the framework. So it's kind of a eat your own, eat your own dog food type, uh, type thing here. So if there's a bug, usually I'm using it daily as well. And uh, it, there's more incentive to get it, to get it squashed and to have things right. For the most part, I think we're doing pretty, pretty well. Um, we uh, have an excellent support community. Uh, there's a Slack group that you're welcome to join. You don't have to be a member of the Better Forms uh, 
uh, the IP preview if you want to hang out there and you know make friends or something like that. And uh, it's at Slack, uh, sorry, fmbetterforms.slack.com. And that's really a great place to get start to get support. During our VIP preview, pretty much unlimited support. I'll spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time. Our main goal right now is to see how developers work and to tune this front end up so that they can use that and get to, uh, get to the aha moment faster and get productive. Um, I, I noticed there was, uh, there was Eric, I don't know if that's, uh, if that's, uh, there's an Eric in our, in our, I think I wonder if that's the same one. I'm not sure if it's the same one, but uh, he's building out, he's uh, really quite uh, doing really, really well as one of our developers and, and he's building out an entire application, entire front end uh, portal, replacing their existing web direct one. I think uh, uh, Patrick as well, I think you just launched just the other day, uh, uh, Topher had just mentioned to me that you just launched the, the donation gateway, is that correct? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, we did the, uh, the donation gateway is launched um, with, uh, if you go to, you can actually pull it up if you wanted to, which is uh, chathambroke.org. Oh, that's too hard to spell, okay. Yeah, I know, it's a tough one. <laughs> Chatham, B O U R B O R O U K B A R B I R B A R O Q U E dot org. Is that right? Chat ham. Yeah. Okay. There we go. That should be it. I think that's it. And then yeah, if you go to the donate page. Down there, uh, scroll down. Uh, okay. That, oh, yeah. Okay. Cool. Frame it. Yeah. yeah. So I haven't. I have, to be honest with you, I haven't even. Uh, uh, I just saw this the other day, for the first time. So this is kind of neat. And 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 we uh, this uses uh, Stripe Gateway, and we actually built the Stripe Gateway. We added the Stripe Gateway because we didn't have one. Um, it took us about you know maybe half a day or something like that to add. The framework is really extensible, and we use other people's code um, underneath the hood. Stripe actually has their own code. And there's some conditional things here. So you can see that condition changes for the dedication, no dedication honor. Oh, that little, another little thing pops up. Somebody wants to join. And some other stuff like that too. I'm not gonna fill the whole, actually, you know what? I will fill it. I, I won't, I won't, I won't. Uh, I'm just gonna do this if I could. You can I, donate, they probably won't mind. Yeah, no, <laughs> I'm sure they won't. <laughs> Uh -oh. All right, so this, this actually, you can see the PayPal, or sorry, PayPal, what's it called? The Stripe gateway comes up automatically, which is kind of cool, right? So it, it, this is Stripe's actual code. So that means this transaction is 100% secure. There's absolutely nothing that's leaving this client uh, browser that's not going between this area here and Stripe themselves. Right, that's why they have their own their own uh, code for that. So that's kind of uh, that's kind of a neat use case. Um, our yeah, goal. Yeah, once is, they donate, then right, everything is dumped in the FileMaker database on the back end. All the right. donation record, everything goes right into their main system. Yeah, and when Stripe when that Stripe item completes, it automatically passes you all the information back from Stripe. And just just for reference, just to see how easy that is to implement. Let's say on my my little demo application here. If I wanted to add a Stripe payment gateway, I'm going to replace my checkout button. Uh, there's a button here. Actually, I'll stick it in front of it for now. We'll have two buttons. That's okay. I would go to Stripe. I get a an API key. This one's just a test one, but I would get an API key from my Stripe. Stripe to set up a client. That's all I have to do. I don't have to set up any callbacks or any 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 stuff like that. I don't even have to know about what that stuff is. And I literally, once I have that API key, I go over to here and boom, there is my Stripe page. Uh, this one here is just part of the the. It's part of that 562 page thing here. It's just a part of the demo. But that would be my Stripe. My I complete my item, and my script gets back the information from Stripe. So an integration is honestly, it's about two minutes long if you just had to, if you had everything prepared. 
So I think it's pretty easy to add. If you have clients that, uh, from a FileMaker developer, from a consultant perspective, if you have a client that's, oh, I want to add this or add that, the cost of one VIP license, that's a yearly license, already you can charge, you know, two or three times. I don't know how much you charge your clients, but typically uh, in the course of the next, you know, with two use cases, maybe five to 10 to 20 X return on your investment. So it's pretty, pretty cheap that way. And the nice thing is you can charge them recurring revenue because you're supporting it if you're not already. That's what I would do. We have a number of people who are already uh, starting to build uh, SaaS type things and they're building really small SaaS things too. I had uh, Dave Pong, he's a, uh, um, a developer and he's uh, quite, uh, he used to work for FileMaker and now he's an independent developer. And, you know, he came up with this, uh, just he already had a client that had asked him for something, but it wasn't practical from a cost perspective to do in, in um, it's a timekeeping app, but it wasn't practical for a very special industry um, to do in, in WebDirect. So he whipped it up and it's in beta and he you know, spent maybe two days working on it kind of thing. It's very simple. It's not much more than what you see here, but the client loves it because it's for them and it interfaces with their application. And then now he's gonna charge uh, recurring revenue for that. And I think that's a great idea. I think from a FileMaker developer perspective, start switching into this recurring revenue rather than just, hey, I'll build you your app and you can make lots of money off of it and I only get one time. I don't, I don't, I, don't uh, I think we need to kind of change that in our, in our industry a little bit. And hopefully better forms can enable people to do that. So, um, does anybody have any questions about anything else that we've gone to, anything I've gone through so far? Don't all speak at once, crickets, Bueller. I, uh, I tend to speak fast and, and uh, have lots to say, so I so apologize if I stepped on any toes. I don't, I don't think I have. Um, I'm going to leave you just with a couple, couple things today. And this is kind of my own, my own stuff. And just it's kind of my due, due, due diligence as uh, um, I, I've been so fortunate to work with, with literally about 30, 40 developers and hours on hours where they have the mouse and I'm staring at their screen watching them work. And uh, I, I've learned so much just from that alone. Um, and it's not just about being patient because they're all, they're all very bright. Um, it's not so much that at all. It's more about how we do different things to do differently. Uh, one of the biggest ones is eat your own dog food. If you're, if you're doing something, have at least, if, you, if your app has the ability to run your own business, try to do that as well. I think that's a real good one. When you write code, too often we just bang out stuff. Client wants something done and we bang out really ugly code. I generally tend to do about 70% of my work is uh, subcontracting. Um, that's including stuff that's uh, built out of better forms. So I always try to write from the devs optic, meaning, meaning if somebody else is looking over that, can they read it? Is it, is it readable? Try not to just instantly react when you're writing, when you're making some changes and things like that. So a lot of times we, uh, you know, somebody will contact me, hey, can you reboot the database? Can you do this? Can you do that? Can you just instantly? And it's like, I'm very, very hesitant. It's like, okay, explain the problem to me. So I think that's a, a kind of a, a really good uh, um, um, thing to, uh, to keep in mind. This is an incredibly important one, practice separation of concerns. If you're not doing this in your, in your coding, um, you really can get so many benefits by changing. Separation of concerns would mean for this particular app, oops, uh, the, the demo app that I had, the gateway for if I added that Stripe component on here, the, compo the script that handles the Stripe part would be a separate script. So that way I can call that, that payment processing gateway from anywhere. I don't have to call it from just from all one, one script. And by having separation of concerns allows you to increase your testability of things and it allows you to uh, write much more uh, reusable code. And likewise, don't be afraid to refactor. Although it costs us money to refactor, that means uh, uh, if you knew need to coding refactoring means taking a piece of uh, taking a piece of code and if it normally did a then b then c and then it repeated it did that maybe you had a separate sub uh, section of code sub script that did a another script that did b another script that did c and so on so i think those are uh, those are things i think i mentioned i mentioned a little bit about uh, um, about the naming conventions if you can start to use those those ones drive drive anybody that you have to work with if you if you really can be really consistent, and that's the biggest thing I think is consistency, and um, 
And now with our, over the next five years, you're going to see a ton of JavaScript being integrated into FileMaker. And in fact, it's going to be becoming part of uh, um, that ability to have, to, to, to have function as a service is going to be incorporated into uh, FileMaker hypothetically, because I know all of that, I'm not supposed to say stuff, whatever. Um, that's going to become a feature of FileMaker. And when that happens, it's going to go out, go through the roof of, of, about writing code in different languages. And it's just going to give us so much more flexibility. And if you can start to use those naming conventions now, it's really, really good, especially ones that are compatible with JavaScript. That means no spaces in the names, no dots in the names. Don't start uh, things with numbers. Don't use uh, hashtags and, and stuff like that, and hyphens as well, all within the uh, in the names. If you can stick to those kinds of things, super, super, you're going to put yourself way further ahead down the road when it comes uh, comes time time for change. So, and I think that's about that's about all of the stuff that I have for you guys today. And I think we're at our time ish limit, but I have uh, lots of time for questions if you have any other ones. Or one, so I don't feel too bad and feel shame. <laughs> because you know I'm the type of guy I'll feel bad. <laughs> Um, do do um, do you have any any use cases where you have clients that have the potential to have something else in their application, but you're limited by the scalability or the licensing? I think that's a, a, a kind of a good a good start to to look and you say, hey, can I do I have a use case for this? Because initially most people don't think of stuff, and then you start processing it. And you go, oh, you know what? You know, Acme could use this. And uh, that's a good opportunity. The VIP promo is going to be on for another Saturday, for another about two weeks or so. And then we're actually not going to our full price. This is about 60% off. We're going up to our next tier because we're going to be starting to develop, develop features and uh, more uh, documentation and things like that, too. So as soon as those things start to ramp up, then the price will, will ramp up as well. But you're locked in at this price, so it's a pretty good option. I think it's a good deal. So there, so. I had a question, but I didn't want to interrupt you while you were in the, in the zone, and then now I can. In a <laughs> yeah, go ahead. No, it's like I had a question, but now I can't remember. Oh, I see. But you have one, but it's gone. All right, sorry yeah. about that. Yeah, by all means, just interrupt me. I talk too much, so I know that. Probably why I was married twice. Okay, well, guys, I'd like to, and ladies, I'm sorry, in the colloquial sense, um, I'd like to th thank you very much for the opportunity. I'd love to uh, to come down uh, sometime over the next, uh, maybe over the course of the winter, and uh, join you uh, join you live. If, uh, if I'm, yeah. I'm invited back. Not, not all that far. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. It's just uh, it's five about five and a half hours from my house, so. That's not too bad at all. Same distance to Ottawa or Montreal, which is kind of uh, which is kind of nice. So it'd be a nice little nice little road trip. If you do want to uh, take part in our VIP program, if you go to vip.fmbetterforms.com, yeah, vip there happens to be a form to fill out. And uh, you can uh, you can take advantage of of things, and you can there's some stuff to fill out there. You can, and uh, this by no means obligates you. But what we'll do is we'll just touch base, and and if you have a use case that you can uh, you you figure that you could use, I can help you to build it out. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. And if you have any questions, by all means, just uh, feel free to contact me. You can, um, I think I, I put, put some information and some information on the uh, on the original email that that, uh, that was sent out too. So thank you very much, guys. Much appreciated. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. And like whenever whenever you finish a meeting, there's always that seven seconds of unawkward silence while everybody fumbles for the exit button. I think they should. <laughs> You should add some machine learning code in here that automatically pops a button up really big when it listens to the conversation. It says, hey, are you about to end this? 
So. <laughs> All right. Do you have anything else, Charles, or can I take? No, I don't. That's it for me. Thank.